go ahead and move into um, our panel. Um, so it is my pleasure to start welcoming our panel to the stage. Um, first with Amy Ashida, who's the Director of Technology Transformation at Tele Technology Transformation Services Public Benefit Studio, part of the General Services Administration. Rachel Carson, who's a design lead at Sevilla. Jordan Burris, who's the Vice President and Head of Public Sector Strategy at SECURE. And Elizabeth Laird, Director of Equity and Civic Technology, Center for Democracy and Technology. You can read more about all of our speakers um, at betscanner.org slash benconbios or scan the QR code. Um, as a reminder, you all have note cards, so have those at the ready as you have questions coming to mind, and we'll be reminding and starting to collect them about midway through. Um, so we invited um, this amazing panel um, to join us really because you all represent a diversity um, of perspectives and in experiences both inside and alongside government. Um, some of you are former and current public servants. Um, and we think that you all are doing truly transformative work to ensure equitable and ethical access to benefits. Um, so let's go ahead and start with our first question for all of you. Um, could you each share from your perspective what's unique about digital benefits delivery right now? Sure, I'll start. Uh, so one of the things that's really exciting right now uh, has been has been building over the last couple of years, really got kick-started and jump-started by the uh, customer experience executive order out of the president's office. So um, one of the many things that that kick-started was a focus across the federal government on how can we orient our services around the experiences that the American public experiences in day-to-day -day life. Uh, and instead of focusing on how our org charts operate, we can actually start by, by looking at a few different life experiences. So my team at uh, the Technology Transformation Services has been supporting a couple of different life experiences, one around facing financial shock and the other around uh, the experiences of families with children zero to five. And so uh, this has looked like a lot of interagency collaboration uh, and a shift in thinking about, okay, what are families experiencing and how can we orient our services? How can we coordinate with different levels of government at the state level, uh, the local level, the county level, and really make sure that we are, uh, we are meeting families where they at, they are at that they are getting the information that they need at the right time, and that we are really orienting around them. So I'm really excited about that work. And of course, I would be remiss right now to not acknowledge that we are in the midst of public health emergency unwinding, uh, which is presenting both uh, a very unfortunate, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are at risk and currently losing uh, their benefits, many due to administrative burden. So uh, that is one of the other things that we are trying to be very thoughtful about and mindful as we look to both understand and capture administrative burden and move toward removing uh, the barriers that cause people to lose benefits that they would otherwise be eligible for. Um, so those are those are some things that are very unique about this moment. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of need for us to respond and make sure that we are both taking care of people and that we are incorporating the lessons that we learned from the pandemic. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Um, yeah, I think something that's really exciting we're seeing from a state perspective, as Seville is a nonprofit design studio who partners with um, state agencies in Michigan. And we're seeing that there's just really been great advancements in access to digital benefits over the last five years that was highly accelerated by the COVID pandemic. And we're seeing that um, state agencies immediately now understand the value of having easy access to benefits, applying, renewing, um, et cetera, online, and that they can no longer rely on folks coming into the office. And so opposed to years ago where there maybe that was the some tension there, I think there's more and more awareness that we need to make access to benefits very easily uh, accessible online. 
And there's a real bell curve across the US in terms of how folks and um, different agencies are approaching this. But we've seen in Michigan, they were really prepared for the COVID pandemic because they had done a lot of upfront investment in uh, the full enrollment process being accessible online when folks were desperately in need during COVID. So yeah, I think that's a really um, exciting advancement is to see that people are, and agencies are really focused on, on increasing that access now. Okay. Yeah, and so um, <clears throat> from our perspective, uh, you know, at Secure, we're, we're interested in seeing all the conversation and dialogue that's currently taking place as it relates to, to digital identity and, and really fraud prevention broadly. And, you know, it's been highlighted that the, the pandemic did things to accelerate the way in which we thought about digital service delivery in particular as an organization. We believe that everyone, regardless of uh, race, age, gender, socioeconomic status, should be able to access digital services uh, seamlessly and, and without friction. Uh, and as such, they it must be intersectional and being able to work uh, for all of them. Uh, the, the interesting part for us today is um, as organizations have had to grapple with really what was the sprint towards digital services in many cases and that shedding of what was a lot of in-person manual processes, they're now taking a step back to rethink what should this look like? What does good look like in this space? And so it's a moment of reflection to talk about how we can actually improve on uh, the way in which individuals assert uh, their identities really in those online forums. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great. Um, so I have uh, one answer with four parts, Mariel. <laughs> <laughs> Give them an inch, they take a foot. Um, so I wanted to start by saying uh, that I'm even on this panel is something that is different because if you looked at the bio of where I work, the Center for Democracy and Technology, we are obsessed with privacy. We are obsessed with uh, mitigating bias and inequity. Um, and I think for a long time, the folks who had that perspective were seen as agents of no, like we're just here to tell you reasons why you can't do something. So I would start with saying that there's a perception that this is not, I'm not an agent of no, but it's a yes and. Yes, we need to realize all the benefits that I know my panelists have talked about and will talk about. And we have to be just as focused on protecting people's privacy because for a lot of folks, privacy is safety. Privacy is a barrier to accessing services, especially if they don't trust public agencies. So that's one. Um, two, I think that there's a shift that privacy um, is no longer viewed as just an issue of legal compliance. I think folks hopefully assume that, and I say this too, I worked in state government for five years. So I say this with much respect and humility, but that we're not breaking the law. I hope that that's what they expect. And really what they are, if you listen to what they're concerned about, it's, can you keep me safe? Can you make sure that my data doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Can you make sure that people aren't using this information about me to limit any kinds of opportunities? I think that's a really different question than, you know, did the, the lawyer sign off on something and we can say that it's legally compliant. I think it's a different group of people involved. Um, the third shift um, that I've seen and I'm excited about and would love to hear um, promising examples if y'all have any, is that, and I say this again as I, my first blog in my job was seven lessons from a recovering bureaucrat. So I say this with, again, a lot of respect, um, but that you don't have bureaucrats making unilateral decisions about what's good for people but that you actually find meaningful ways to engage communities with an appreciation that communities are not a monolith and they have really different perspectives and some folks who you're trying to target can be the hardest to reach. And so how do you incorporate them to make sure that one, you're addressing their concerns, but two, you're actually building something that they want and will find helpful. Um, and the last thing that I'll say that I think is new um, in uh, digital service delivery uh, has two letters. Um, does anyone want to guess what they are? <laughs> two letters, what? Yes. 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 AI. 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 Mm -hmm. That's that's a good answer too, though. <laughs> um, so I think the other the other piece of this is AI, and it's already come up um, both in terms of the ways that it can really revolutionize um, a delivery of public services and work more efficiently and try and find patterns that we might miss. Um, but we spend a lot of time also calling out the ways that it can have the exact opposite intent, which Ariel, you actually teed up really nicely yesterday of the very things that we're putting in place to help people can also be the very tools that are used to discriminate them or limit opportunities. That's my four part answer to your one question. <laughs> I don't know about all of you, but I'm pretty excited for the table that we just set up for this conversation. <laughs> Thank you all for those opening thoughts. Um, Rachel, can we turn to you now? Um, I would love to hear more about what's foundational to the way you all work um, at Sevilla and how that might be able to be scaled across the field. Yeah, absolutely. 
So this image is a very helpful description. Um, at Sevilla, we call this the person on the path. And this describes the approach that we take to human-centered design. So um, human-centered design is really central to the foundation of how we work in partnership with communities as well as government agencies. And I think for all the public servants in the office or in this, in this auditorium or the former public servants, you'll, um, it'll be familiar to you to know that you, know, you wake up every day, you came to this role because you care deeply about the communities you're serving. Yet because of policy constraints, technology, age old technology, um, challenging business processes, you end up uh, building some of these brick paths that you see here, um, even though your intention is to serve the community. And so central to our work is looking at how do we lift up the experiences of the users who are going to create their own path and who very well know their unique needs and bring those, um, lift up those experiences to the agencies that we're partnering with and find creative solutions to address these, the technology constraints as well as policy and business process. So really central to us is thinking about how um, human-centered design it's not just a phase in a project. This is a deep practice, a deep commitment. Over the last seven years, there's not a, a week that's gone by that our team is not listening to folks who are navigating these systems and looking for ways to integrate their experiences as we're partnering with agencies to roll out new systems. And so a central piece is human-centered design, but then another piece that's really central for us is a commitment to implementation. So you can do a research sprint up front, but at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, how you implement it, given the user needs, the technology and the business process is really when um, the value is shown. And I think human-centered design has become a bit of a buzzword. We've seen large scale technology vendors use it in ways to um, promote maybe an early research phase or a late research phase, but it's not always done with the highest quality or integrity. Um, but for us, we look at it, as I said, as a deep practice and listening to people's experiences and carrying them through implementation is really central. Um, and then the third piece in terms of implementation is when we're listening to folks' experiences, we also need that partnership from courageous leaders at state agencies. So we need to be lifting up their stories in creative ways. So a third part that is really central to our work is looking at creative storytelling with stakeholders. Um, you know, there's institutions are not designed to change. <laughs> there's a lot of inertia to just maintain the status quo, but there's also courageous leaders who, again, are waking up every day looking to serve the community. And so we look for ways to lift up the experiences of folks navigating those um, these systems and share that in new ways. And so one way that we do that is we have a immersive installation at our studio in Detroit where we walk folks through the experience of navigating benefits. And through that, we've walked thousands of people through and we've seen a few lessons from that. Um, one is that folks will lean in when they hear people's lived experiences, as long as you're balancing quantitative data, but also speaking to them in terms of with their head and their heart. And so um, when we look at our approach to change and looking at how do we change these systems so it better meets the user's needs, we're thinking about a long-term commitment to human-centered design, committing through implementation, not just an early research phase, um, but looking at it from the beginning to the very end, and then um, engaging leaders in new ways so that they can really understand and lean in to take this risk and try a new way of working. Thank you so much. Um, there was a wish shared yesterday at the end of the day about scaling Sevilla so that okay. every government could work with you all, um, <laughs> which, you know, in the like longtime civic designer here, um, that was that was not a, a thing that people were even asking for. And so yeah. I think of like really thinking about some transformational change that's happened recently, mm -hmm. um, but also where we're headed. I'm just, I'm really excited that we have people asking for that now. Yeah. <laughs> Right. All right. Um, well, let's move on. Um, back to you, Amy. Um, what are some of the big systemic shifts that need to happen to improve digital benefits delivery? Uh, so I am a huge fan of simple solutions. Uh, so instead of describing the the uh, enterprise solution or that I think could be a big seismic shift. I really love to focus on the building blocks that help us create the experiences, both for the public, our communities that we're serving, and for the staff 
that support and deliver those programs. Um, and so uh, within GSA and uh, the General Services Administration and within the Technology Transformation Services, that's one of the approaches that we often take is what are the building blocks that we can help provide programs. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of really interesting ways that we can take the current current situations uh, and, and make really meaningful improvements on them. And so one of those things that my team is specifically working on uh, is around making sure folks have the right information at the right time. Uh, a lot of times I hear, oh, I'm working on this really big integrated eligibility system. It's like, okay, are people going to get the information they need at the right time? Because if they're not, your fancy new technology isn't going to matter that much, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, my team is working on a tool called, uh, currently called US Notify, uh, that programs can use to send text messages uh, to participants. And we're looking at a variety of different use cases, currently moving into pilot on that. There's a few other really exciting things that are happening across TTS. Um, I think one of the other pilots that's happening across our organization is around thinking about digital identity, but not just in the digital space. Uh, how can we uh, work with post offices uh, and physical spaces uh, that people across the country have access to? Even if you live in a really rural area, you likely have access to a post office where your nearest uh, government office may be multiple hours drive away. So I think really thinking about these tweaks that that we can make with the infrastructure that we have totally acknowledge that we need to update our infrastructure. Um, but I think thinking about the changes that we can make to take steps forward that actually really make a difference in how long it takes for people to, uh, to access the programs that they're trying to access and whether or not they continue to have access to those programs. Great, thanks Amy. Elizabeth, back over to you. Um, could you tell us more about how government can further incorporate equity into digital service delivery? Sure, I can uh, start the conversation, but <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert, I do not have the answer. Um, I'll start with just a bit of a story about um, some of the work that we've done around using data technology ethically. Um, I think it was three years at this point, we embarked on a research project just to understand what does it even mean, uh, both in terms of you know, interviewing folks in, in government who were attempting to do this, talking to foundations, talking to academics, you know, reading uh, you know, uh, anything we could get our hands on really. Um, and for as many papers as we read and people that we talked to, that's how many different definitions we got of what it meant to um, use data technology ethically and responsibly. So I'm gonna offer the way I think about it uh, with a pretty significant caveat, which is that um, it can and should change. Uh, you know, using um, data ethically and responsibly and technology ethically and responsibly is not something you'll ever check off your list and say, you know, did it, now we can move on to something else because policies change, demographics change, people change. You know, this is a, a dynamic field. Um, so I offer that as just context setting to maybe lower the expectations of what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, but I'll say in terms of you know, how I, I think about equity in the context of digital service delivery, I think about it as a two-sided coin. Um, on one side of the coin, um, it's a lot of what we've been talking about for the last 24 hours. It really is about making sure that, that benefits and all of the, the positive things that come from the use of data technology are available to everyone. Um, and so one example of that that hasn't come up as much, but I'm sure y'all are all over is, um, you know, closing the digital divide. So making sure that, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, that those things are available to everyone. Another example is being really focused on accessibility and making sure that the tools that you're providing work for individuals who have disabilities. Um, you know, one that is, is close to me um, is that, you know, families present in really different ways. Um, and so how do, how do your systems and your programs accommodate? Um, you know, families that may not look the, the same as, as what it maybe has looked historically. So, so one side of the coin is really about maximizing benefits. Uh, the other side of the coin is being just as obsessed, again, this is a yes and, um, but being just as obsessed with making sure that um, no particular groups of individuals experience disproportionate and negative harm because of the use of data and technology. Um, and I really believe that those things can and should go, go hand in hand. 
Um, but one of the, the one of the things that we've researched is um, in some states that have um, automated uh, benefits determination and benefits, uh, sort of the, the amount of benefits that you should receive, uh, have had negative consequences. Um, it's resulted in uh, people losing benefits or um, uh, losing the, the amount of benefits that they were receiving. Was that the intention? Of course not. Well, that's what I believe. Um, and I, you know, having worked with government folks, uh, I mean, there's, you know, maybe one or two people you encounter along the way where you're like, why are you here? For the most part, <laughs> you know, <laughs> folks are, are doing this work because they really care about helping people. And so what I really love about the work that we do and appreciate being, you know, on this panel is that we can, you know, there, there are better ways to do this. And how do we sort of shore up our skill set and our knowledge, our capacity to, you know, put in place those guardrails that we need to make sure that we are maximized on all, all of those benefits and that, so I'm jumping ahead, so let me not scoop my own answer for a later question, uh, but that both of those things can and should be done. So that's how I think about equity and how we think about it as a project. Um, again, knowing that I would love to hear about how y'all are thinking about it, because this is not something that, again, will, will ever be something that you, you know, say, well, now we can move on to something else because we've ensured that for, you know, eternity, our systems will be equitable. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Jordan, over to you. Uh, what are the most important things government and industry should be doing as they implement digital systems to improve access to benefits? Absolutely. So I'm curious by a show of hands, and this includes those who are joining virtually, uh, how many of you have had to wait uh, online or like a, a, a phone in order to get access to a service or benefit, or maybe you had to go in person in order to engage in doing that? Okay, so just just about majority. Now, uh, keep your hand raised if that is your experience every single time you go to access uh, a digital service. So there's a couple of hands uh, where, where that's highlighted. I think that in and of itself highlights um, a problem that we see broadly within uh, the industry today is that for far too often for many people, um, that that they are uh, presented with friction every single time that they go to assert themselves, uh, their identities online and being able to prove who they are ultimately. A lot of that comes down to what are systemic gaps that exist in our identity infrastructure. If you were to ask me, and I say it quite frequently, I would say it's fragmented and broken uh, ultimately. And it, and it really comes to what is an over-reliance and what I would say two different basic ways in which people prove their digital identities or their identities today, right? One being um, relying on what is the credit ecosystem as the proxy or the gatekeeper, if you will, for asserting someone's identity. Uh, for those who do not have, you know, uh, large financial backgrounds or who have not been engaged with that system, myself, I wasn't actually able uh, to, to get a credit card improvement until I was in my mid-20s. Uh, they're largely left out of that ecosystem. Um, furthermore, the, the, the alternative to it is when you're not using this, this heavy credit-based uh, approach, you're probably relying on what would be, they would say, foundational government documents uh, at the end of the day in order to, to confirm who you are. I mean, some would say driver's licenses, uh, ultimately. Well, if you look at Real ID in particular, you have the requirement that you have to have a social security card, you have to have birth certificate, so on and so forth. What happens in the instance that you don't have access to those things? Um, how much burden are we putting on you? Uh, in order to, to, to prove who you are. Uh, you know, I often talk about my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, who when she was born uh, due to no fault of her own, due to clerical error, she was not issued a social security card. Uh, and so uh, one day in the hot Virginia sun, uh, my, my wife and I had to venture down because both of us had to be present uh, with mm -hmm. our daughter uh, to wait in line at the social security administration in order to uh, request, present the child and, and <laughs> request that they release uh, the number for her. Now, I did this because I recognize I work in the identity space, right? That it is necessary for what would be the future. But what happens if you, A, don't have the means in order to do that? Or furthermore, what if you're like me, my younger self, where I grew up in a family, and I think the technical term uh, would be, um, we grew up broke, uh, where uh, every hour spent not working was uh, uh, detrimental to uh, our livelihood, right? Often living paycheck to paycheck and every hour um, being the difference between whether or not we were able to eat or pay the electric bill in particular. And, and, and don't get me wrong, there's, you know, my father worked very hard in, in doing a lot 
what he had to do to take care of our family, but the system wasn't necessarily set up to, to accommodate everything. So for those mm -hmm. folks who don't have those foundational documents, they're further left out of the process and not being able to engage. That those are two examples, uh, you know, I used to highlight, you know, some of the, the, the gaps associated with identity, but even fast forwarding to, you know, today, uh, I very recently had to apply uh, or for a birth certificate. I, I realized um, later on that the thing I thought was a birth certificate was like a registration for birth, um, <laughs> not not the brightest individual. Uh, and so someone said, you should go to the Department of Vital Statistics uh, and go to, to get that applied. Well, when I went to apply, they they asked me some questions. Uh, about my history. Um, now, I was able to answer most of them. There was one question that stumped me and using the same tactic that I used to get through college, um, eliminate two answers and guess 50-50 on, on one of them. Now that 50-50 answer, uh, fortunately I was able to get that right, uh, but that was the difference between me being able to get my birth certificate and not being able to get it uh, ultimately. We continue to put these types of barriers in front of people uh, and that keeps them out of out of the system, out of being able to engage uh, ultimately. Uh, and the work that we do today, we, we find that the foundation basically needs to be shored up and we need to start looking holistically at individuals beyond what would be these two uh, facets in particular. There's other data points and elements that can be uh, analyzed and evaluated in order to confirm that we can bring the right individuals uh, into the process, that we can confirm that they can get their identities uh, proved ultimately and that they're not having uh, to be left behind. When we get this wrong, we see instances of those those long review wait queues, uh, folks not being able to get processed. When we get this right, you have folks that are able in seconds uh, to get access to the services that they so desperately need, and they're not having uh, to wait. And, and, and ultimately, across the industry, what we need to be doing is uh, increasing transparency about our ability as um, providers or those who serve in this space and work with our organizations. I would also say the government as well. And I say this as a former Fed, uh, we need to be a little more transparent um, that we should be talking about the areas where our systems don't necessarily work for everyone, right? What is our ability to uh, accurately identify individuals, right? What is the percentage of folks that have to go through some sort of friction or challenge uh, ultimately, and you know what what is our, our our degree of accuracy in terms of being able uh, to get it right? Uh, it by only by doing that are we actually able to start. And there's many more metrics associated with that, but only by doing that are we actually able to start to hone in on some of the root cause problems as to why we're unable to get people through these online channels versus defaulting to the I would say in some cases the belief that. When you're unable to go online, you should just be able to go in person. Well, for those who raise their hand and they always have to go through that process, that shouldn't be the case. You should be able to, if you choose the online channel, being able to go and complete it through the online channel. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I find it unacceptable uh, personally that that's still the case uh, in, in many instances. And so from, from my pr perspective, a lot of it comes down to, you know, we all need to, you know, come together and start to you lean into to measurement and transparency to start to try to address some of these you know systemic barriers that we we have today to being able to prove who you are. Thank you so much for that, Jordan. I want to remind everyone that you have note cards, and so I hope you all have a lot of questions for these wonderful experts. And so I'm going to ask them some quick response questions now. Um, so while you think of some more questions, and once you have a note card ready, if you could pass it to the end of your row and hold it and we will have volunteers who are coming down the stairs to collect those. Um, so back to all of you, we can go in any order, anyone who would like to respond first. Um, what are some of the positive trend lines that you're seeing right now? Dialogue, I'll start. <laughs> the, the awkward silence starts to kill me. My wife will throw something usually at me. No, I would say that uh, di dialogue in this space, uh, honestly, is, is a positive trend line, right? It, it, far too often, there, there has been not enough conversation about what isn't working. Um, and so, you know, great events such as this uh, allow us to actually be able to change, exchange ideas, thoughts about what, um, what is evolving, what does need to change, and then allowing us to better drive uh, improve outcomes ultimately, right? It's only by starting to shine a light on these issues that we're able to really start to, to, to make the changes that we need uh in this space i'll help jordan out so there's no more extra thank you awkward silence <laughs> um i i think we're seeing a lot of leadership on the front of really trying to modernize privacy and try and get ahead of especially ai um 
it, it just even in the past year, the, the current administration has put out an AI Bill of Rights, which if you haven't seen, um, you should look at, at that, which is really about sort of ensuring that we're not exacerbating inequities by the use of AI and are really being intentional about it. Um, you know, my boss yesterday was testifying on the Hill. There are a lot of hearings about privacy and AI and human rights and just these conversations that um, really feel like they're picking up momentum. And so, you know, as a, um, you know, someone who is not, not running an agency, um, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of meaningful work that can happen, but it sure is a lot easier <laughs> if you have, you know, a directive and leadership saying, you know, this is important and this is how we're going to respond to it. And sometimes that does take there being a law or a regulation or a rule to sort of bring folks into compliance. Um, but I think I'm seeing a lot of, you know, sort of exciting momentum and leadership on um, really providing rules and regulations, also just guidance of, you know, I know when I was working in states, I, I hung on every word <laughs> would come out around how to do something. And especially if there were tools and like, this is great, we're doing this. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot more momentum, especially at the federal level um, around some of these issues, which is um, very welcome. And in many cases overdue. I would love to add on that. Um, speaking of leadership, we are seeing more and more leaders lean into prioritizing deep research prior to building technology. Um, and that's really exciting because I think we've all navigated very um, archaic technology systems when we're trying to access different services. And we've seen in Michigan and across many other states as well, the value of leaning in upfront, of investing upfront in understanding the user needs of the folks who are navigating these systems, um, whether that's, that's both the clients, the residents we're serving, as well as the staff. And so we've seen more and more state agencies, instead of us convincing them of the value, they're really coming and being like, we understand the value. And so we wanna invest upfront. Um, I think in Michigan, the, the My Bridges portal is a really great example. Uh, this is the portal that residents use to access benefits from for the full enrollment process, from applying to uh, renewing, uploading documents and post eligibility support. And from the Sevilla partnered with um, a large scale tech vendor to do and MDHS to do deep research up front and highlight those needs that uh, residents and staff have. And that led to a 50% drop in time to apply, 1300% increase in uploads of documents. And so over two and a half million residents in Michigan are using this system every day. And um, we found that that is a really helpful proof point for many other state agencies. And again, this was something that really supported uh, the state when COVID hit so that those folks could access the benefits they need. Um, so yeah, that's a really positive and exciting um, step in the future we're seeing is that people really and agencies and leaders are really leaning in to, um, to prioritize that upfront research with communities. And I'll build off of the, the dialogue comment. Um, I think there's a lot of cross, uh, both cross agency and cross sector uh, collaboration that is building and, and happening right now, which is fantastic. I think one of the things that enables us to do is shift to uh, from, hey, government, talking to government, like what do we think is, is the problem here? What do we think is a cool idea? <laughs> to shifting to, okay, what are the actual lived experiences of the people that we're serving and how can we start to orient around that? Um, and so I think it's really exciting to see uh, communities coming together that include government and advocates, that include uh, people that are fighting for language justice, that we're actually starting to think about all of these different uh, experiences that people have when they interact with our services um, versus just, hey, it's hard to do Should things in government. Right? And oh. so, which is absolutely true, but our mission is not to make government easier for ourselves. Our mission is to serve the public. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to see a shift in both, okay, it is government's mission to do that, but we can't do that by ourselves. We must do that in collaboration with the ecosystem that we are in a, a part of. So I am very excited to be here, um, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, but I think it's just a really positive trend that I, I hope continues to build. 
Yeah, I agree. I love that trend that we all get to hang out with each other <laughs> um, and work together um, and having popped around a few different organizations that work in this space. It's also neat to see it from different angles. And I think some several of us have made moves across this space too. I'm going to save my last question um, because I have seen a lot of note cards moving in this room. Um, okay. Oh, your mic went out. Okay. All right, the first question is, what new customer-centered performance might you all recommend um, for SNAP, UI, Medicaid, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, clarification likely means customer-centered uh, performance metrics. Jordan. So y'all know I'm gonna jump Jordan? in. Uh, you know I'm gonna jump in. I, was, I was trying to fight it. Um, <laughs> So look, uh, looking at the perspective of, of digital identity, right, there, there's some four core ones that I, I tend to look at um, just to, to start off, right? Your ability in, you know, uh, in, in our business, we call them auto approval, but the, the ability to approve someone's uh, identity or verify someone's identity online without them having to be subjected to undue friction uh, is one thing. Um, it's because you can start to then from there, if you get more information beyond that, again, this is a core you're supposed to build on top of it. If you get more information beyond that, you can understand like what are the reasons why they fall out, um, right? We see upwards of 50% abandonment rates uh, in online processes from the experience when there's too much friction as, as part of it. Um, other things that you you know should be looking at are false positives or false negative rates because um, not only false positives because you're inadvertently subjecting someone uh, to, to undue burden in order to prove who they are, but from a false negative standpoint, uh, look, we have we have a fraud problem as well uh, that must be called out, and it's not to say that that should prevent us from delivering services or that we should make it so draconian that folks cannot get access to those benefits. But there's ways in which you can manage simultaneously um, the challenges with security and fraud, at, along with managing what would be the the customer experience. Other things, and if you're looking at uh, what would be the, the broader return on investment or or management of solutions, would be you know the cost of manual review. Uh, to an organization or how much manual review is being done, right? There is uh, person hours that are, are, are associated or allocated towards that. And that also translates to how long our review queues are going to be, how many lines are going out the door, right? Those are, those are uh, for me, success measures as to how, if you're able to get those lower, um, right? What, what that uh, ends up looking like um, uh, ultimately. Uh, and and a, a lot of that, um, you know, the, the last piece would be, around, and again, I work in the identity space, uh, fraud capture, right? Your percentage of you actually being able to stop the bad guys at the door. Uh, and, and that's because, you know, what we saw is that, you know, the, the fraud that took place during the pandemic, it wasn't uh, a one-time event. It's something that's been persisting. There was a great event that took place, which is why it became mainstream, um, but they're, they're not going to stop. And as we hear with, you know, stories of SNAP as individuals have had their benefits intercepted. And, you know, fortunately, some states have been able to help make them whole. Uh, as a result, that's not the case all, all the time. And some individuals um, turn away from the process when they find it too hard to be able to recover their identity. Uh, and, and so it, it's important that you're also able to have a high degree of being able to capture and identify more or less, uh, you know, what the processes are. And again, that's that's my view on how do you start to improve these access to services from um, looking at it under the identity lens. I agree with Jordan. <laughs> uh, I'll hop in here. I think um, in terms of metrics uh, and and customer experience and looking at how long it takes people to do things, mm -hmm. how long it takes them to fill out an application, how long it takes that application to get a determination, uh, how long it takes for people to then receive the benefits that they applied for. Um, I think there's things around how long it takes internally within the government to process that and to get the information um, that we need and how much of that are we doing uh, that utilizes the data that we already have versus asking people for information that we could find ourselves. Um, and so those are some big ones that are just like in in the eligibility process, what can we what can we measure? I also think the things that are harder to measure are the things that um, around people that we are not currently serving. Um, so one of my uh, favorite biases, least favorite biases, I don't know, I try to keep keep this in mind. Um, 
it's called the survivorship bias, where we tend to optimize for the people that make it through because they're the people that we have contact information for. Uh, so we can reach out to them for user research. But guess what? The people that didn't make it all the way through the process, we don't have their contact information. And it's much harder for us to go and and actually learn why they fell out of the process. And so when we make system optimizations, we often are optimizing for the people that it's working for, even if it's hard. Um, and so I, I don't have a metric to put on that, but I think it is, you know, there, there could be just some binary things on like, are we taking actions to understand, uh, to actually work with communities that are not making it through the process versus are we doing user research in the first place? I would definitely second, third, both of those answers. Um, I think the only other thing I would add was, it's again, probably not exactly a performance metric, but is who are we speaking to and how are we measuring that? Um, we take a lot of effort to look at the variety of users that we're um, engaging with, some folks that are harder to reach if you're using, say, like usertesting.com or an online platform. So we're looking at community partners, nonprofits that are active in the region. How do we find folks that are, act, that are connected to those communities and that they can refer them to us? So we're getting a range of folks in urban versus rural counties in all parts of the region, so of the state. Um, and yeah, I think that's a harder thing to measure, but it's often the success is often shown in the final product when it does meet their needs. Um, the next question is actually for you, Rachel. So we'll stick with you. Um, the importance of implementation and follow through was raised by Sevilla, mm -hmm. um, i.e. not doing discovery research in a vacuum. What are examples of the timeline or approaches you've seen as working or not working? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, let's see, I think um, I will start maybe with speaking, yeah, I'll start in speaking from um, a few, there's a few technology projects I've been on. One was the My Bridges portal, which I mentioned, now I'm actively on the child welfare system, we're redesigning the case management system for workers who are um, processing child welfare cases. And we've seen that the discovery research up front, um, the size of the research really depends on the size of the module or the technology. So in the case of child welfare, they've broken up this huge case management system into multiple modules. Um, and so we are matching the size of our research to the size of the module. And so the, the amount of functionality that exists. Um, so discovery research could look like anything up front from three months for, for example, for an intake, which is um, if there's a case of abuse or neglect in your community, you're calling to, uh, there's a f someone who's picking up the phone processing that case um, or investigation, which could be a longer process where um, your uh, the family is actually being investigated, unfortunately, and so there's a lot of back and forth between the caseworker and the family. And so um, we've seen in our research, it could be from three months to right now we're on about like nine months of discovery research up front. And so this is a big, yeah, it's a big investment for leaders to make up front before we're building. How do we actually understand the real needs? And so we've been doing dis um, discovery research for. Um, yeah, about it's going to be almost like a year and a half um, before uh, some of the technology is being built. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a general sense, but again, it can be pared down and expanded depending on different needs, depending on the size, um, and also kind of depending on the partnership. Anyone else want to respond on time? Cool. Um, this is a good one. I also believe that anyone should be able to access services online. Do you have concerns that as online access improves, in-person access will go away, then affecting those who already have limited access? No. So I, I, I don't have, to, because I would put it this way. One of the things that, and I will speak as a former uh, former Fed, one of the things that are top of mind for anyone in government is making sure that there are pathways to being access, being able to access services in particular. I do view that we are at a point in time where as we start to embrace the technologies needed in order to allow us to operate and in, in, in conduct transactions in an online manner, that if we're not careful, in some cases we could see the pendulum swing the other way where we're almost forced back mm. to uh, in-person interaction only. And so I think that with the right 
level of transparency, the right level of discussion around the types of tools, techniques, tactics being used. In particular, we're able to see uh, what would be a movement towards uh, online first for those that want to use it. But from a, from a government standpoint, there will always be an in-person option or, or something that's made available because there are those who just will, will not go through uh, the online uh, channel, right? They don't have access to it. Uh, and it, it, is, it is too burdensome uh, to try to get them access to it uh, in particular. And so it's about being able to to adapt to those uh, in particular and, and understanding what the, the, the impact is broadly um, of what really what is the shift to using online more. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I was talking to states at a conference recently, and one of the things that they brought up was that uh, the pandemic has highlight, like, highlighted both how important digital access is and how important the offices are. Uh, and so I think I I would be surprised if, if all of that went away, there would have to be a big seismic shift for that to happen. Um, but I do think that it's interesting, even though we're, we're talking about, okay, the pandemic helped us bolster all of our digital systems, the opposite also has happened. We're like, wow, our offices are critical pieces of our infrastructure. Um, and there's some really interesting examples where states have uh, you know, have kiosks that access their portal in the office where they help people sign up for things online and get that going. So they're going in person and getting them set up so that then they can do things online in the future. And so I think those intersections are really interesting where we can overlap the different levels of our services um, and make sure that we are treating people with dignity uh, throughout any door that they come through. Yeah, we actually just published um, a case study on work in Oklahoma from their Department of Human Services, um, where over the last handful of years, they've like downsized their offices, they got rid of a lot of old buildings, um, and they have built these beautiful, dignified, modern spaces, um, including for sensitive situations like child welfare cases, um, and have really thought about the technology that underpins that and also have not laid anyone off. So no workers lost their jobs. They have been deploying more people into community where people actually are. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have some very interesting, um, more public and shared metrics about that work too. Um, so it's definitely something that's up on the digital benefits hub, uh, something that we think is an approach that could scale to other um, states as well as they're thinking about their real estate strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think from a privacy perspective, that's one of the things that we recommend, especially you know, the, the more invasive the type of technology is, the more you want to give people options, um, which can include in person, it could include, you know, other sort of maybe less invasive types of technology, especially when you're talking about facial recognition. Um, but I think optionality was talked about a lot yesterday. And I think this is a space that it's um, really important to keep that in mind too. Hmm. Anyone else? Cool. Um, if you could change one thing about government IT enablement practices, what would you change? Just one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just... Let's start with one. So if you all list, we'll have a list of four. <laughs> <laughs> one A, one B. <laughs> I'll hop in. Um, I think one of the things that we are really focused on is uh, helping people start somewhere. Uh, a lot of times, and uh, before I was in this role, I worked as a consultant. I consulted with states on integrated eligibility and enrollment systems. Uh, and and uh, a lot of times we see we need the enterprise, like this whole spaceship to be built. And that is what is going to equal success. And guess what? Most of the time the spaceship fails. Uh, and in the time that you were working on that, you could have delivered some really neat meaningful things. And so it's uh, not that the aspiration is bad, um, but how can we break things into, into smaller pieces that we can try sooner and build on and build on? So that's one of the things that we're trying to do with our pilots um, is really to enable programs to try text messaging at all, because we realize that that is a is a huge hurdle in just trying it. You don't need to send a text message to every person in your state. Um, you could target a very small population and a very particular program to understand, hey, is this going to create the outcomes that we are looking for before we go through all of the hullabaloo of rolling this out and updating all of our systems and doing X, Y, and Z? What can you try in a couple months? 
uh, instead of saying, you know, I heard lots of stories, procurement timelines take years, yeah. like five years. Uh, well, what could you do in a shorter time period of a couple months to learn something that you can then build on so that by the time you get to that five-year mark, you have a whole lot to show for it? I think I want to piggyback on that and, and, and talk about um, performance-based testing in like those short sprints. Um, you know, far too often it may be only set uh, a lot of procurements and I've also been uh, engaged with various procurements where there were those long drawn out timeframes uh, in, in particular. I would say it would be it would be intriguing and I would and, and actually something I would recommend we you know continue to move towards is taking more of these uh, incremental performance based measures so a vendors or those who are working in the space who are looking to help meet the requirements of the government are actually put through their paces up front. So that way you have an understanding of who is best likely to meet and match the use case that um, that way you're not getting a year into a procurement a deployment, realizing it does not work, uh, trying to fix it uh, and then having to about face and do it all over again. Uh, and you're actually able to identify really the, the best solution fit for purpose uh, such that it can you know serve the needs uh, of the public. Mm -hmm. I think for me, this question makes me think of a piece of advice I got in terms of meeting facilitation, which is that when you go into a meeting, you know, you need to have a goal and the goal can either be at the end of this meeting, we will have solved this problem, or at the end of the meeting, we will have agreed on a process to solve the problem. And they're actually really different. And I was just reflecting on, um, you know, uh, since this project has existed, I don't think we've written anything that didn't talk about the importance of governance, like little G governance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so many of the decisions that we see that are made and that I was a part of, or sometimes not a part of, I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> um, you know, it comes back to, you know, do you, do you have the right process in place and the right perspectives and skill sets, which gets to community involvement and also gets to, are you pairing your program folks with your IT folks, with your privacy folks to make really informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little bit of a cheat answer, but I do think I would really focus on that the people who are around the table when all of these decisions are being made, because I don't think this is a, a meeting where at the end of it, you'll have the answer. <laughs> I, but I think you can decide on for different you know types of decisions, who are the people that need to be involved so that not just what you have planned, there's so many things that aren't planned. Like, where do you take those things? And so often they're crises and you know, they fall in someone's lap and maybe they don't make the best decisions. Um, so I would make a pitch for not coming to, you know, here's the answer, but here's the process we're going to go through each time these things come up that will get us to the answer. Yeah, I really like that point on process and both of what you both shared. I think um, building off of that, the the importance, again, of, of building in smaller sprints, um, I think we've seen in, in past technology projects, the, you know, the focus on the waterfall method of like taking years and years and years to build and to prepare and then to do the big bang launch and it doesn't always land well. And so the, the importance of doing these iterative sprints, however, as we've been partnering with agencies in Michigan to do that, it's really hard. There's really, um, con there's like conflicts with the way that government institutions work and with the way that technology is developed ideally through like agile or shorter sprints and so they're trying to find creative ways to meet those the requirements and the budgeting that they have to set up front with the needs of the users which we know um, is better met through these iterative cycles and i think the other thing i would add is just the interview process for vendors um, it's one, it's just so hard for agencies to find a diverse range of different vendors that can build the systems for them. I think the RFPs are extremely long and complex. If anyone's I'm sure many other people have gotten some like eye twitches from reading these very long, um, RFPs or writing them. And so they're really catered to larger companies and agencies that can invest in that. And then once they actually get to the interview process, I've talked to state partners who, they, you know, they're trying to make the best decisions they can, but they don't have all the information that they need to make a call in some of those moments. And so we've seen in Michigan, they're looking for really creative ways to get a better sense of what is this vendor going to deliver to me before I sign on to a multi-million dollar 10-year contract. And that's such a huge investment and such so much pressure to put on um, individuals to make up front. And so how do we, how did they find better ways and, and partnerships? with others to make better decisions in those moments, but to have access to better information and to make sure that 
um, the, what they're being pitched is actually what's available and that they maybe have the right people around the table who can ask the right questions to really uh, dig into what are you promising me and what am I actually going to get. All right, we only have a few minutes left, so we're going to end with a rapid fire. We did a collective community wish list, but I wanted to hear from these four. What's their one wish for the future of digital benefits delivery? Um, I can start because this is where I almost scooped my own answer, and then I remembered later <laughs> you were going to ask me. Um, and it's not one of my wishes that I wrote down yesterday, so I'm going to make awkward eye contact with many of you and online, I can't see you, but I see you. Um, my wish is that we all see a role for ourselves in supporting privacy, in supporting the equitable use of data and technology. And that even if you don't see your, you know, see your role for yourself, like this won't work if it's just one person's job. It won't work if it's just two people's job. Like this has to be part of our value system. And that you know, the the digital service delivery, we will only achieve those benefits. If we all, you, know, you get to equity through that, you get to equity through protecting people's privacy through building trust. Um, so I hope if there, you didn't come into this panel, you know, thinking that, you know, sometimes I go to panels and I'm like, oh, I'm about to hear about something really hard that has nothing to do with me. Um, so hopefully you're walking out and there's a little kernel and a little, you know, seed you feel like you can pick up and plant for yourselves and your home organization. And we're, we're here to, We've got Miracle Grow. We've got a great shovel. We've got all the the tools that are ready to help. But that's my wish: is that you know we're bought into this and we can work together to um, you know realize a lot of the vision that we talked about. Yeah, but if I was to go, I would say that you know getting to a point where the services that we're seeking to deliver specifically within government um, are seamless, right? And it's not something that can be or that is. Um, very hard for individuals to get through. Now, I'm not going to uh, lie and say that there haven't been strides that have been made. There absolutely are. I run into um, states and, and other uh, federal agencies who are making uh, changes and improvements every single day, but we're not there across the board. So getting to this, this end state of nirvana, if you will, where everything is seamless and it works basically the same as you would expect of uh, what happens in the commercial world um, for products and services that we're using uh, that's what I would like to see. And I think, you know, for us to start to set some of that foundation, going to be a broken record here, uh, leaning into what is the, the transparency and measurement, right? Because we have to be able to identify where are those gaps? Where are things not working? Where are there systemic way, uh, issues and how we've designed things and we haven't designed with equity in mind that are preventing folks from being able to get through the process? Yeah, I would say uh, in the near term, I would hope that access to digital benefits is, or access to benefits is available digitally through the full life cycle of the case. So we're seeing some states where you can apply online, but then um, you're renewing on paper or you're searching for all your documents around town and faxing them in, trying to find a fax machine, or then you're calling your worker. And so if there's a way that we can, in the future, to have that full enrollment process, that full eligibility, everything that you need, that process to be available digitally, I think that is a wish that we have in the near term. And we're seeing a lot of states lean into that. And then I think something that we would love to see more momentum on in the long term is more cross enrollment between agencies. So if I'm applying for unemployment insurance and I'm waiting to hear back about my case, how about you refer me to the health and human services agencies so that I can access food stamps or medical insurance, and then you can send me to find some resources on jobs or housing. And so um, seeing more uh, connection, connecting the dots between these agencies, I think is something that we would love to see in the long term. But a big piece of that is around digital identity, is around finding ways that agencies can um, do data sharing between them. Uh, so that is definitely a, a hope and a wish that we have for the future. I do too. <laughs> we'll allow you to. I'll go fast. <laughs> it's, it's they're the same. It's long term and short term. Uh, okay, I'll start with long term, and that is like, my wish is that we could really create a world where uh, where we are centered on the people, the families that we serve, and that is like can be lip service, but I mean like reorgs uh, going way beyond data sharing agreements um, to actually being like, these are these are families, these are people, let's make sure that we are organizing around them. Um, and that can be a seamless experience as you navigate across government. Um, 
I know there are risks involved in that, but this is wish time. Uh, so uh, in the in the shorter shorter time frame, I think my wish is really continuing um, to see organization around outcomes. Um, so what what is the change that we are hoping to see in this investment? And just being really really specific about that. If we're going to spend a dollar, a million dollars, a billion dollars. Uh, what do we hope to see as a result of that investment? Because a lot of times we start with solutions. And we're like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had this shiny object? Right. Uh, and I would love for us to just double down on what is the change that is going to happen if we do this thing? And is it worth doing? Um, otherwise, let's find let's find the changes that we really want to see that really actually mean a lot to the people that we serve uh, versus the things that we think are cool. Well, thank you all so much. I hope that you all have a conversation now that you can be coming back to when you need a dose of reality, a little inspiration, and a look to the future. Um, so let's give this panel a big round of applause. Mm -hmm.